I'm Rishan Barat at the Microsoft Executive Spotlight Series. I'm joined by my colleague Ten Kip, who is a director at Microsoft Worldwide. Today's session, we're going to be talking to Cliff and Mike at a company called CalTire. CalTire is a wholly owned Canadian company based in Vernon, British Columbia. It was founded in 1953. Its business comprises of retail tire sales for passenger and light truck vehicles, mechanical services for passenger and light trucks as well, and commercial truck tires, mining and off-road sales, and service for re-threading both commercial and off-road tires. Ted and I have asked Cliff and Mike to join us today to talk a little bit about their business model, but also talk a little bit about how technology is enabling their business and also their partnership with Microsoft. So let me start things off by saying thank you so much, Mike and Cliff, for taking the time to talk with us today. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, gentlemen. It's great to be here. I think let's get started with you sharing a little bit about CalTire. Talk to us a little bit about your business model and who you are as an organization. That's great. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned in, in, in your introduction, um, CalTire is Canada's largest independent uh, tire dealer and one of North America's largest commercial dealers. So we have you know, really three distinct areas in terms of the, the customers that we serve. We have our, our retail business, which is you know, predominantly sales and service around passenger vehicles, uh, our commercial customers, and then ultimately our mining customers. Uh, we have warehouses located across Canada. Uh, we service over 250 uh, corporate owned uh, CalTire stores uh, from those warehouses. And predominantly, again, those stores are in the, the retail and the commercial space. Uh, our mining uh, tire group is an international leader in mining tire services and supply. Uh, we operate in over 150 mine sites around the globe, which takes us across five, five different continents. You know, and, and around the globe, we have uh, well over 6,500 team members. So pretty good organization uh, led from, you know, a small town in uh, Vernon, BC. Great. Well, Mike, I'm going to jump in here and I just want to add my welcome and thank you uh, for, for being a Microsoft customer. We're, we're very, very happy to have you, uh, both of you uh, here today to speak with us. It, the pandemic has, has turned a lot of businesses model upside down. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how the pandemic has had an impact on, you know, one or all three of your, your core business operations that you were just talking about. And, and if there's anything innovative or, or different that you could share. Yeah, great question, Ted. You know, it's been a, an unprecedented year, of course. And, you know, the, the biggest impact we saw was specifically in our stores division. And clearly our number one goal was to keep our customers and team members safe. Um, you know, with uh, the various provincial health authorities uh, that we were following uh, their guidance, you know, we wanted to make sure that we had enhanced safety protocols in place. So, you know, early days of the pandemic, it was difficult to ascertain what that actually meant. So, you know, we went to what we defined as emergency services. And we really locked down uh, the level of business that we did to make sure that we were only supporting uh, customers and business activities that were actually deemed, uh, you know, an emergency service. So we weren't just doing our regular operations, but, you know, if uh, customers had um, tires that were worn out and we needed to repair those or helping with emergency service vehicles, you know, that's where we were concentrating our activities. And then once we figured out what enhanced safety protocols could look for us, how we could serve our customers safely, how we could um, manage um, social distancing within our locations, we moved to more of an essential services model. And through that model, you know, we, we closed down our showrooms, which, you know, uh, for a, a retail uh, service center, you know, predominantly our customers would walk into our showrooms as they, they bring their cars to us. So, you know, locking down those showrooms was a pretty big uh, disruption to our business. And so we really had to move our customers to communicate with us through other channels. So as opposed to walking into our store and coming up to our counters, you know, we saw a lot of increased traffic through our e-commerce platform. Uh, so our customers were able to go online and, you know, buy their product or book their service online. Uh, we saw a big uptick in our retail service centers as well. So customers that actually wanted to talk to a team member, you know, they could pick up the phone and called uh, the retail service center. And I think the biggest impact that our customers would have seen was the use of appointments. 
you know, so we were really judicious about the the application of appointments. So we didn't want to have customers coming down to our locations and, you know, being in close proximity to each other. So by staging out those appointments, we were able to, you know, enhance the, those, uh, the social distancing. So we, again, really wanted to make sure that we were protecting our, our customers and our team members, but still really wanted to allow our customers to shop the way that they wanted to shop. Yeah, Mike, so just a, maybe a quick follow-up to that. As we, thank goodness, move our way through this pandemic, do you think that the uptick, say, in e-commerce will remain? Or like, how are you you seeing the use of e-commerce versus maybe going back to the brick and mortar um, as as people have kind of learned that it does work, right, in a in an online environment? I'm just curious if you have a thought there. Yeah, I think we we generally believe that we'll we'll hold on to that uh, uptick that we have seen through those other channels. I think our customers have appreciated having that flexibility uh, that they don't necessarily have to come down to the bricks and mortar. Uh, that they can, you know, still get that trusted advisory service that they come to expect from Cal Tire through other channels. Um, and, you know, for ourselves, I think we've learned how to better operate in that environment as well. And we are definitely more efficient uh, when, um, you know, we're able to apply um, the appointment standards and we can book our staffing and we can get our customers in and out in, a, you know, a specified period of time. I think I think we've all come to appreciate having the, the flexibility. Yeah. yeah. The, the thing that I would add to that is um, we've had our um, e-commerce solution in place now for a number of years. Um, and I'd certainly call it sort of class leading for our industry. You know, when we were building out our e-commerce solution, we weren't just trying to be the best of the tire dealers. We were trying to give our customers a, a world class um, digital experience. And um, so if you go and have a look at caltire.com, you'll be able to see the kind of experience we provide our customers. Since we've had that in place, we've seen year over year doubling in the adoption of that um, by our customers. Last year was truly unprecedented. Um, you know, it, the, the, the growth was fantastic. And I think, you know, every large retailer that had a digital experience saw a similar growth in, um, in um, digital commerce. The number of Amazon boxes that got delivered to my house was unprecedented. <laughs> in all time. I was going to say the same thing, Cliff. <laughs> yeah. So our customers were adopting that those kinds of channels um, with us um, as well. Um, and we've continued to invest in that to provide more service to those customers. And it's not just our um, our retail customers, you know, you and I, who, who are seeing a need for this more touchless um, commerce not wanting to spend a ton of time in our stores, wanting to get in and out quickly. Um, but even on the, on the, we've seen a growth in these digital touch points with our commercial customers who have similar needs to protect their team members and want to drive efficiencies into their business. So we, we're seeing this definite growth in kind of the digital connections to, um, to our customers. The, the other big impact um, that wasn't business, but more internally for us of the pandemic was the massive immediate shift to remote work. Mm. Um, you know, it, it certainly the, you know, it was, uh, it, we went from having everybody a traditional office-based culture, right? Where you came to the office to do your work. Um, and we went from that to the office is empty within a week. Um, and uh, this happened in a number of our businesses. Our field service business, where we had these dispatch centers, suddenly everybody was doing dispatch from home. Um, so we were, I guess we were well prepared for that in that we had had broad-based adoption of Office 365 um, and Microsoft Teams. We were probably one of the first Canadian Canadian <laughs> uh, customers to move to um, to move to Teams back in the day when it first became available, um, and that has really been an enabler for us to um, to continue to um, operate our business. The same as our modern networking firewalls and cybersecurity tools have also um, really helped us um, bear through the pandemic. I love your whole incorporation of really understanding the entire customer journey the entire customer service, the entire customer satisfaction element of it, but then also enabling technology to ensure that there's simplicity with your customers as they engage with you 
and as you acquire new customers as well, right? And the uptick that we referenced earlier on there involves a lot of new customer acquisition, i.e. growth, and also going up against the competition. I'd be very curious, in addition to what you've already described, I'd be very curious to learn about how do you stand out against your competition and really establish that trusted platform and relationship with new customers? I think we've talked a little bit about how, you know, we've been able to differentiate ourselves in our retail space, um, you know, where that kind of um, innovation, I guess, really comes to play for us uh, is within our mining business as well. You know, and really in our mining business, it, it is about being innovative. Um, we've got a very uh, varied uh, customer base uh, that have, you know, very different goals, whether or not that's reducing costs or, you know, improving the uptime of uh, that mine site or fulfilling sustainability requirements that they might have. You know, Caltire, we really feel that we've got proven solutions to be able to meet those customer needs. You know, so for example, to help, you know, customers drive productivity, we have our tire operating management system that we uh, developed within Caltire. And this uh, tire management system, you know, allows our customers to maximize uptime of their fleet, um, has gives them good line of sight to data to help performance and safety requirements. Uh, and it really does help manage the, the fleet productivity uh, on the mine sites themselves. You know, and it gives that near real time access to information to allow the mines to, to run them as efficiently as they can. You know, and some of the other areas that we're helping solve customer needs through innovation is around their environmental sustainability requirements, uh, specifically around, you know, recycling end of use tires. So if you think about a big mine site um, that's operating a fleet of haul trucks and, you know, they have the, the ultra, set, ultra class size tires on each one of those haul trucks. And, you know, as those tires reach the, their end of life, you know, we're trying to help solve customer problems by, you know, helping them recycle those or, you know, responsibly dispose of those uh, tires. So we've just invested in a thermal conversion facility uh, in Chile, uh, which allows us to, to re recycle those giant sized tires. So basically the thermal conversion process, it really decomposes that organic material with uh, heat and the absence of oxygen and it converts those tires back into their original components. So, you know, when we're done with the thermal conversion process, we're left with fuel oil, carbon black and steel. You know, and it really is, you know, a couple of good inputs back into that cir circular economy. So, you know, through innovation, we think that, you know, we position ourselves to be able to help solve customer problems. And we see that as being, a, you know, a differentiated service offering that uh, Cal Tire does have. Yeah, if, if I were to add, when I think uh, while Mike was talking there, I was reflecting on the kinds of things that make us unique in, in our industry. I would say, um, you know, uh, right from when T Tom Ford founded the company, we've always been a, a people uh, people company. You can buy your tires from anybody, right? Um, but if you're looking for friendly, well-trained professionals delivering high quality service, and that are always willing to go the extra mile, you came to Caltire for that, right? So we are very much known as a service company um, and we're known for our people. Um, the other thing I think that differentiates us um, certainly is our reach. Um, we have a large network in Canada um, of over 250 stores as, um, as uh, Mike referenced, but we also, as Mike also said, operate on five continents in the mining business, which is makes us the global leader in, in that business. We have a sort of a very appealing, consistent set of um, full life cycle customer offerings. Mike described the kind of recycling and uh, some of the innovation that we're doing there um, that are we're able to offer consistently um, to, to our customers. Consistency is actually important, right? Yeah. You, know, you, you want, if you're a large fleet, or even if you're just, uh, you know, me looking for tires, I want to know I can get a consistent level of service regardless of where I go. So we are able to do that. We have strong relationships with all the major tire suppliers and manufacturers. So if you need tires, we're your, your, your company, right, to do business with, especially during a pandemic when you know what supply chains look like, right? And you see what's happening in the Suez Canal. You know, and, and everything else. Right. If you need tires, you know, hopefully they're not on that ship. If they, if they are, come and see Cal Tire. We'll help you out. <laughs> um, 
and then I, I think uh, we will talk a little bit more about the the whole um, innovation side of it. But I think the other big one for us is this focus on sustainability um, that Mike also referenced because you know, tires and what you do with end of life tires is a big problem for us as a world, right? You know, you, I'm sure we've all seen the pictures of the giant piles of tires, right? Um, and those kinds of things. And so we're trying to help our customers and help our environment and um, deal with, um, with this challenge, which once again is, is an important part of for what we offer to our customers. Yeah, I love that. I love how you guys are looking at the entire value chain or, or even adding on to the value chain, right? To your business model, um, which which is fantastic. And Cliff, I was on my bike this weekend and I rode right by a giant pile of tires um, <laughs> and sitting there in the woods, right? Because it yeah. was a nice place to drop them off, but they're not decomposing. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, Mike, I'm going to turn it back to you and I'm going to try to kind of extend the, the conversation that we were just having. You know, you are a global leader. You've just talked about how you're extending the value chain into this really important topic of sustainability. But as a global leader, over 250 stores, from what I understand, you know, 6,500 plus employees, what is the, the force or the wind in your sail kind of looking into the future in terms of, growth drivers or, or principles that you're using to continue to expand and, and, and offer great services and quality products? Yeah, I, I think, you know, to what we've kind of already alluded to, you know, our, our investment to our growth is really going to come around, I think, that differentiated service offering. And what can we do to help solve emerging customer problems that they may be facing? You know, so helping them around their mobility needs, whether or not that's, you know, within the retail space, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of change coming in vehicle ownership, electrification. Uh, so making sure that we're staying at the forefront of that and remaining relevant uh, for our customers. And then again, from the mind sites, it's, you know, maybe as we look into the future, it's less about the actual product sale and more about that full uh, service offering. So helping our customers uh, at the beginning in terms of what is the right application or the right product for them with where they're operating. How can we maximize the uptime of their fleet with a good proactive or preventive maintenance program? We also have our retreading and repair facilities so that we can extend the useful life of those tires. And then ultimately, like we've already talked about, helping with the end of life tires. So, you know, it's really about positioning ourselves to help solve those customer problems or customer needs. And so that, you know, when I look at what our uh, investment criteria would be, you know, it's going to be in complementary businesses. It's going to be around solving those, uh, you know, customer customer problems. But ultimately, uh, we also do have some investment criteria that uh, that need to be met in terms of return on investments and, and the like. But. Yeah, and for me, it's very much what Mike said is about the customer has a job to do, right? We could just sell them the tire and leave it at that, right? But that doesn't really help the customer solve their problems, right? It's about us deeply understanding the customer's needs and have helping them get their job done. For you and I, um, you know, in, in areas where we change over our winter tires, you know, you've got you, you know, you you need to be able to safely transport your family, right? So it's not just the tires, it's about the brakes. When you're changing over to your winter tires, who wants to store your winter tires in your house? Right? How do we how do we help our customers solve these problems that they have um, around their mobility and, and their vehicles? For our commercial customers, it's about getting service anywhere, anytime, right? Not just when you roll into a Cal Tire location, but out if you're stuck on the highway in uh, you know minus 30 degrees in northern um, you know northern Alberta, how do you get help to get you get those groceries to market or or whatever you need to do? On the mining side of our business, those big tires um, not only are they hard to find because they're tough to manufacture. But then again, you have to get the life out of those tires or meet your objectives around the productivity of your mind, right? And a lot of your productivity of your mind is dependent on that contact patch between your truck and uh, and the earth, right? So it's not only solving the, the problem of fitting the tire, 
but helping our minds understand how hard can you run that tire, right? Um, do your whole roads, are your whole roads correctly built and configured to maximize either the throughput or the life of those tires? What do you do when you take off, you know, you know Ted, you mentioned, you know, you rode your bike past a giant pile of tires. Imagine a tire that, it, you know, the, on, that's on those giant haul trucks that are my cam, how 20 feet high. Imagine dealing with that as a recycling issue um, as well, even for our manufacturers, right? So we're not only solving problems for our customers, but even for our manufacturers. In certain jurisdictions in Canada, um, the manufacturers are responsible for dealing with the tire at the end of its life, right? So we're able to help our manufacturers achieve their goals through that too, right? So we have strong partnerships on both sides and we're solving problems for everybody um, around the tire. Incredible context there. You know, when you think about the growth of drivers that I've captured from everything you're, you're talking about, it's really being able to be relevant, really being able to be a problem solver for the customers, identify the problems in advance that you're solving, but also not only make an impact to your customers, there's other circles around that and that includes things like your manufacturers, but above and beyond that, your people and the environment as well, right? And so I'm very curious to know your thoughts around how technology plays a role in those growth drivers and business outcomes that you've labeled there. Yeah, so I think when when I think about technology's role in that, um, in if you look at our consumer market, sort of selling tires to you and I, Certainly, that best-in-class e-commerce experience is is an important um, an important factor for us. Um, certainly, we I, I would say we are certainly class leading in that space. And the other thing, though, that the technology does there, it's not just a pretty face, right? It's a nice website, um, and that's about it. That e-commerce solution is fully integrated with our business. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's actually the secret sauce there is the fact that when you go to Cal Tires website um, and you look at the tires, we have real time views of the inventory of those tires and where it is. Um, once once you've picked the tires that you're interested in, um, you're able to see real time availability of appointments in our stores. Right? That's not an easy thing to do. If you think about it, the, if a store has to deal with both walk-up traffic and um, and um, appointment-based traffic, being able to surface real-time what availability is there for the customer so that they know when they walk into the store at that time on that day, their tires will be there, those tires they ordered will be there, um, and we're able to service them in, in a timely fashion. When the order is placed, that order drops into our supply chain and into our stores so that team members know who's coming to visit them. So it's that fully integrated digital experience for us on, on the consumer side. When we look at our commercial business, there, there I'd say a, a lot of, it's more about providing that consistent high quality service to our customers, but there we're seeing more sort of growing modern digital connections with those customers through a variety of, of, of channels. Um, it's different to just, you know, a B2B site. Our customers want to be integrated with us. Some of the fleet management companies that, um, that we do business with, um, they have customers too that they're trying to satisfy. So you know we're we're working with both with the cust with their customers and with them as a customer to to service the the needs and a lot of that is turning into a more digital kind of um, interaction for us. I'd say in our mining and mining space we've really been driving the digitization and the the you know really making use of our breadth on the mining side to. Um, build out really unique offerings around tire management services. Um, Mike mentioned earlier a system that we call TOMS, which stands for Tire and Operation Management System that we believe is unique in the industry. Um, we collect a vast, I, I can tell you, a vast amount of information about tires and their performance on these hundreds of mine sites. You know, we're talking about real kind of big data related challenges here as we consume, you know, sensor data and other things and use that to help drive the management of our customers' um, tires. In the, in the, you know, previously, the way you manage these tires tended to be kind of rules of thumb, 
right? You know, in this kind of environment with these kinds of loads, you do these kinds of things to the tire. Well, now with this new technology, we're actually able to, based on atmospheric conditions, whole road conditions, local needs of the business, of, of that mining customer, get it down to almost the management of an individual tire, right? And its life cycle, um, as opposed to working in these generalities. So really doing something very unique with that global data set that we have, that we think nobody else is able to, um, and certainly nobody else is collecting it at that um, level. Mike also referenced the thermal conversion. That's unique. Nobody else is doing that. We've invested in, you know, in, in building out something there that's really unique in the industry. Also on the retreading side, um, in, our, um, in, in our retreading business, looking at ways of extending um, the usefulness of the rubber, the rubber waste that is produced by that process devulcanizing the rubber and seeing if we can make more use of it um, in our business. And then I guess lastly, but not least, least, when we look at innovation, Mike mentioned it's stacked in our business, um, even down practically at the field level, we have uh, interesting innovations that come up like, um, if any of you have ever seen a torque wrench for a haul truck, it, it looks like uh, it looks like that gun that Arnold Schwarzenegger um, <laughs> carried around, right? It's this huge thing that weighs I don't know, Mike, like a, like eighty pounds or something like that, right? So this torque wrench yep. is a big thing. So part of what we're doing is we built this gravity assist system that um, allowed the team member to move this around without injuring themselves. And also even opened up, um, you know, our ability to hire different people with different abilities to uh, to work in a more diverse workforce working in in the space um, for us. Things like rapid deflators. Once again, think about that giant mining tire. When you stick the penny on there to deflate that tire, how long do you think it takes to deflate the tire that's 20, 20 feet in, in diameter? So we had these things like rapid deflators that essentially suck the air out of the tire at a high rate. It, just massive productivity gains from something as small as that. So we've got this practical innovation um, in the field all the way through to a lot of these kinds of technology fueled um, innovations. Sorry, just one thing that I want to add back to when you were talking about, uh, you know, our e-commerce platform. I think the one thing that's really interesting to that and the benefit it provides to our customers is it allows them to still utilize our trusted advisory or, you know, that, that trust that they've built with Cal. You know, in the past, when the customer would walk into that bricks and mortar building and talk to one of our uh, team members, you know, they would be able to articulate, you know, what, what they were looking for, what type of vehicle they drive, what type of conditions they drive under, and our team member could recommend that product. You know, we really have tried to replicate that within our e-commerce platform so that the, the the customer can, through their own guided selling process, end up with the same recommendation, you know, put in their vehicle type, how they drive it, what they're looking for. And, you know, they, they should be able to get the same recommendation from the e-commerce platform that they would had they talked to one of our sales and service team members in a store. So I two things uh, came out as I was listening to you that I, I, I think are fascinating. Um, the first thing is just just this whole concept of creating a digital feedback loop with a tire you know, is is fascinating, right? It, it was really interesting because we talk about that, but I've never heard of it, you know, in the context of an individual tire, and, and, but it, it makes sense. Why not, right? Why would we do that? And the other thing that, that is really coming out to me is um, oftentimes, Rashawn and I uh, will have conversations with companies and they're just struggling to keep the lights on, right, within the organization. You're talking about massive innovation and and in many respects being freed up is, is is my assumption to think about these these really strategic things that you can do to to offer additional services to your customers which i think is fantastic and cliff that leads me to my next question which is you you've shared with us your journey right uh and where you guys are going as a company could you talk a little bit about the role that microsoft has been playing uh, with you on your journey. Yeah, I'd first like to just make one point about the innovation side of it. Don't get me wrong, it's hard. 
to it's hard to do and it's hard to build into your business because you know you still got a business you need to run on a day-to-day -day basis there are bills to be paid payroll to be made money to you know we still got a business so you know don't get me wrong we we have a lot going on in innovation but as with any company it's not always easy to to balance the the needs of both right but we certainly recognize the importance of this innovation and how it can help our business grow and if we are going to become um, more than just somebody who sells you some tires, right? If we're going to solve your problems, we've got to go and solve those problems, right? <laughs> so um, so that's where the innovation comes in. How do we solve these problems? And, and that's really what the focus is um, in each of these businesses. So when we think about Microsoft, um, I guess if you're, if you're running a large enterprise, I think you'd have to work really, really hard to avoid doing business with Microsoft, right? <laughs> you'd actually have to really apply yourself to that. So uh, I think Microsoft is is a reality um, and doing business with Microsoft is a reality for most, almost all um, large enterprises. Having said that, um, you know, Caltire has been a longstanding Microsoft customer. Um, and we have steadily grown into Microsoft's modern cloud offerings um, of time. We have a really strong affinity for uh, Microsoft's uh, modern cloud um, vision, and in particular for myself as the CIO, a real, um, a, a real interest in the way Microsoft is starting to connect the dots for a large enterprise like Caltire, right? Used to be you looked for specific solutions for specific things, um, and what I'm what I'm really seeing emerge is more of this platform for your business, where it these things are no longer disparate and disconnected, but they're all part of solving the problems that Caltire has um, in in running our business, in making us more effective, in making us more productive um, as a company, and improving our our customer experience. So, from a Microsoft perspective in an early and deep adoption of Office 365, and not just as a licensing vehicle, but really as a business enabler, right? Um, one of the things that, you know, Rishan and others know is that I don't like buying stuff I'm not going to use, right? So when we do buy and adopt um, Microsoft solutions, it's about how do we best use it in our business? And we do actually go about trying to use everything we buy. Um, and I think that's been an important part of what made my team and I look good when we all ran for the hills, right, is we were broadly using Office 365. Teams was just a thing we used every day. Um, we knew how to do this stuff already, even as a company, even before the pandemic struck. So when we did need to move um, move into this more digital way of interacting and collaborating, um, we were able to do it quite effectively. Um, we've also had um, broad adoption of the Power Platform. Um, the Power Platform and in particular Power Apps have, have given us a way to put tools and information in the hands of our zone managers and store managers in their stores um, to allow them to do all kinds of things from ensuring that their merchandising is correctly set up to collecting safety related information in the field um, to helping us helping their coach their store managers in um, in the various practices that are are important to our business. Um, we also saw the early promise of Power BI uh, back in the day um, and have been were early adopters of Power BI. Um, and today we see a growing um, within uh, within our business a real sort of growing of the enablement of our business to to use the information the the you know that comes off of out of our business to make better decisions um, we are also now using microsoft's modern um, data platform um, in azure um, and seeing a growth in kind of the consumption of azure and its PaaS um, and is um, solutions all of our international data centers are in azure um, and recently we've acquired Dynamics 365 um, as well, 
um, which we are already running successfully in Latin America and are now uh, currently rolling out in Latin America, uh, in, in Canada. So, you know, we, we are a, a, um, a large customer of Microsoft's um, and as I said, have a, have a real interest in the vision um, because it, it seems to fit our business so well. Um, and um, it, it provides us this room to grow and, and enable our business on all fronts. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've talked about this uh, a few times already, right? You know, we're so excited to, to have you as a customer. And I got to be honest, you know, just listening to the innovation, the drivers, you know, how you pl- apply technology to the growth of your business, it, it really elevates my excitement for partnering with your business. And, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about the selection that was recently made from a Dynamics 365 perspective. You know, being an innovative business, uh, an innovative company, being able to perform customer insights and enable your staff with accessibility to technology to make effective and impactful decisions is one thing. But then making a decision around transitioning a business application or an enterprise application, there's a lot of elements that go behind that. And so recently you've partnered uh, with our team and you've also partnered with Avanard, who's one of our partners in the country, to make a decision to go and change a business application with Dynamics 365. I'd love to hear a little bit about the selection process that you went through. I know you mentioned that you're still implementing it, but I'd love to really understand, you know, how did you define your selection criteria when making the decision? For Dynamics 365. Yeah, so our journey with uh, Dynamics started a, a while back. Um, we have a, a fairly substantial business in Latin America in in the mining and the mining side of our business. Um, they had been running a number of different small ERPs. Our business had grown through acquisition, and so we were sitting with four different ERPs being used in four different countries. Right, which Mike can attest to was a a uh, bit of a nightmare to try and pull together <laughs> and, and understand. Um, uh, so, yeah, Mike, I don't know if it, you can, it, maybe it, it was certainly was challenging. Yeah, I mean, trying to get good financial consolidative reporting from, you know, various entities around the globe. And, you know, to Cliff's point in, in Latin America, you know, every country seemed to be on its own independent proprietary system almost. And even just trying to get local reporting done to even regional reporting to somehow that get that up to a consolidated level, you know, it was really a lot of manual intervention, a uh, very inefficient process, uh, prone to errors. Because, you know, anytime you introduce uh, manual work to a process like that, you bring that uh, increased level of risk to it. So, you know, the fact that they were able to to move on to D365 you know, fairly quickly for the size of that operation um, and, you know, was well adopted by the users and it really did enhance uh, the financial reporting that we got out of that region. Yeah. So we, the our Latin American business team went through a selection process. So they looked at a, at a variety of products. Um, they ended up selecting um, Dynamics 365. And as Mike said, the implementation was fairly rapid and, um, and so the effectiveness of their use of it was actually quite high, right? Um, so that certainly helped us as we were looking at solutions for our Canadian business, which is substantially larger than, than that Latin American business would be. Um, when, when we did go through the selection process for Dynamics 665, we did look at all the usual suspects in that market, right? Um, we wanted to understand what each of them could offer us. Um, and <clears throat> For sure, all of them have very capable offerings. Right? But when when it came down to it, Dynamics C65 was just better suited to our business. Felt that there was better alignment between Dynamics 365's capabilities and the broad um, needs of our business. You know, within one platform, it covered all of our needs from warehousing to you know finance to supply chain to store point of sale. It was all covered within the the single platform instead of having to put together a variety of different solutions um, ourselves. As we've spoken about, we are already uh, very much invested in Microsoft's modern cloud and that vision. And Dynamics 365 is a highly capable modern cloud-based SaaS solution from a provider we can rely on, right? So as a CIO, if I'm betting on SaaS, 
you want to make the right bets, particularly when you're making a bet as large as this is in terms of the, the criticality to the company. Um, the model, the consumption model, um, was very appealing to us. That sort of um, you know, com- you know consumption-based usage model, very appealing to us, right? We can grow into that. We can adjust as we need to. Um, that's what SaaS is about, right? right? It's not about you know spending a, a you know a lot of money up front and then just hoping that you use it. It's a much better um, fit for our business and for the way that we like to work as a company. If we buy software, we want to use it, right? Mm-hmm. That's kind of the key uh, key thing for um, for us. And as the as the CIO, um, for me, the notion of a single business platform is very appealing. Um, and is certainly part of our strategy. Um, you know, it, for sure, modern solutions can be easily integrated, but it's always work, right? And when you're okay. trying to get a, a large um, suite of disparate solutions to work together, it inevitably hampers your agility and ability to get things to market, right? So for me as a CIO, the the idea of a of a, a broad business platform. Um, was very appealing. Does that mean it'll be everywhere? Maybe, uh, maybe not, right? That's very much dependent on the business need, but the ability to have um, have that single platform is important to us. Excellent, excellent. Uh, You you said twice, uh, as I was listening, uh, Cliff, that you want to buy software that you're going to use. And we, we, clearly share that in a consumption-based model. We want you to use the software, but buying the software and wanting people to use it is one thing, but <laughs> getting them to actually use it is something different. And so, um, you know, I, my favorite saying, and I've said it uh, in these series, is one of the biggest impediments to any software solution, or any technology is change management. So I don't know if maybe you or Mike uh, could just yeah. speak to that, that topic of change management and how important it was and what you may have done uh, within your organization or are doing. Yeah, yeah I, I can start this off um, and Mike, I'm sure you've got a lot to say. The, the key point here for us that I think bears understanding is that um, yes, change management is very important to us. Um, especially given that our approach has been one of trying to look at our business with fresh eyes, mm-hmm. right? In very many cases, we have business processes that um, either just through, um, you know, we, you know, that are either there because we may have done something that way for, you know, decades or may have been driven by limitations in our current systems and solutions. So we are very much trying to look at our business with a fresh set of eyes, which often means though that the amount of change that may be required in your business is is higher than um, just doing the same old thing you've always done, right? So um, I think that's an important um, point. I have a few others that make it, but I'm sure Mike has something to say uh, you know, about kind of change management and, and kind of our approach to, to dynamics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, even taking a step back from just uh, dynamics itself, you know, we've talked about the amount of change that we've done through the organization, whether or not it's new innovative approach to service or how we're interacting with our customers. You know, change is something that's been at the forefront of the organization for, you know, the last five or so years. So, you know, it's it's an evolving process for us. And, you know, we hope that we continue to get better at it. Uh, so, you know, some of the learnings that we've had over the last couple of years, we hope to be able to apply uh, to, to the implementation of Dynamics 365. But, you know, it is such a pervasive change to the organization from, you know, how we order product to how it's you know, how it impacts our supply chain to how it impacts the finance groups uh, to ultimately to our point of sale. Um, so every team member is going to be impacted by this. So, you know, it's really, really uh, important that we do have a good, well-articulated change management strategy. Um, and it's going to have to be adaptable because it is going to impact so many different team members at such different parts of the implementation, whether it's up front or, you know, it's user acceptance testing or it's ultimately the training and then, you know, the, the cutover. But it, it is going to be so impactful to the organization. I've been through many, many of these things and you know, even, you know, organizations perpetually underestimate 
the amount of effort that needs to needs to be put into this. Um, we are certainly paying um, paying a lot of attention to this um, and are are trying to do things right there. Um, will we still trip up on things? I'm sure we will. <laughs> it's just mm. natural um, that a change of this scale doesn't come easy, right? No matter how well laid your plans are. Um, but we we are ready for that. And the one thing that I will say is that I think the pandemic also changed or exercised some muscles within our organization um, and, and really got us more willing to or willing to take a look at some of those um, those things we've always done and do things differently. So I'm actually quite hopeful that some of the lessons and the muscle we built during the pandemic over the last year or so will help us do better at, um, at change in, in the future. And certainly finding that our business is more ready for change than they've ever been um, and more able to make rapid change. In fact, change so rapid that we would have previously thought we could never have done right in the time frames we've done. We did multiple times um, this past year. So I, I feel like there's a bit of wind under our sails from a change management perspective because because of that. I can't, can't wait to be celebrating with you on a very successful implementation with Dynamics and also talking a little bit more about the output of change management and also some of the successes that you've been able to achieve with user adoption and user reaction of the platform as well. Always a pleasure talking to you. I think this is a really good place to leave it. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time. Cliff, to you as well. Ted, as always, a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining the series. Have a wonderful day. Yeah, thank you. It was great talking to you guys too. Thank, thank you. you.